Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to this section of the Oregon Voters Digest. Gee, look, I'm getting there. Today. I'm getting there pretty good. You know, the reason why I'm so excited, the fact of the matter is, we've got an election coming up here. We've got one. The voters, voters pamphlet has been sent out to all of you. All of you have, you saw, you saw the copy. I think, Tom, you put that piece on there, right? Okay. Uh, it, it's been out to you. It's the Oregon general election, November the 4th. And I tell you, it's, pretty thick. it's a pretty thick volume, too, by the way. And uh, we need to study it. But at the same time, don't, 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 don't be so quick, if you will, to just start signing off on, on your voters pamphlets. And uh, it's a very, very important piece. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I might make a point that, um, as you can, as you know, the media will always be basically endorsing various folks and sort of like telling you, if you will, this is who you should be supporting and whatever, and coming up with their opinion. But no, as far as I'm concerned, you should be the opinion maker. You are the voter. You are the ones that are going to be selecting your leadership for this state. And it's very, very important that we, we understand that. And for instance, uh, here's an interesting one on, on uh, uh, an, an editorial endorsement, Merkley. And Weeby are both unsupportable. I thought that was very interesting. That's a very interesting one. So, uh, so maybe you want to spend a little bit more time and and not just be so hasty, if you will, to just sign off on and send your your selections in the mail. So take some time. I mean, tune in here at the Oregon Voters Digest here, and we'll we'll give you some other suggestions for that matter. Well, today, and in, in, in line with that, uh, there's an issue here uh, within the state that um, that's been an issue, but whether it's been addressed. Whether it's not been addressed, that has always been the issue. And so that's what our show is going to be today. We're going to be talking about an issue, talking about the Oregon Lottery. The Oregon Lottery. What is the Oregon Lottery? What constitutes a, ca a casino? Uh, where is it? Where are, the other, where, where are these mini casinos? I heard that word, the mini casinos. Are they, are they legal? Okay. So we're going to be discussing this with, uh, with a group of individuals who are who at Hayden Island at High Noon. And they spent quite a bit of time analyzing this issue because, in fact, it's it's having an impact on their community. And I think that's going to be, it's going to be a it's going to be a show that's going to be very informative. And so do sit down and, and take notice of what we get ready to do. Uh, the guests who are going to be with me today in regards to responding to uh, uh, to the the lottery, lottery situation will be from High Noon. Uh, the president of High Noon is Jeff Geisler. Jeff, how you doing? Hey, Bruce. Okay. We've got Charlie right next to him. He's the director at High Noon. Hi, Charlie. Howdy. Judge, too, by the way. Former judge, right? My former life. There's no such thing as a former judge. Yes, you know that, don't you, like Charlie? No such thing as a former Marine. You understand? That's right. That's right, Charlie. Right on. And then we've got Marty. And Marty is the vice chair of High Noon. Okay, good. And the, all of these individuals have spent quite a bit of time on this issue of, uh, of the lottery because of the impact that it's had here on Hayden Island, here in the Portland metropolitan area. Okay. So what we're going to do is that uh, I, they, they've got a, a document here that I've had the opportunity to read. They sent a letter to Secretary of State Kate Brown, and uh, that was the date of September the 19th. It was in the form of a petition, and I'll read, this, I'll read the petition. It said, the petition to the Secretary of State to request the Oregon Audits Division to conduct an internal compliance audit with consequences of internal control and compliance of the Oregon State Lottery. Okay. Generally, what we're going to do is then that we're going to definitely we're going to spend some time talking about the content of this petition. But before that, we're going to educate you about uh, the the whole issue of the lottery here in the state of Oregon. And maybe we'll start off. Maybe we'll start off with um, with the whole idea: of what is the definition of a of a of a casino? Well, Charlie, you're going to take any, any of well, them. Well, the just Oregon. In the, let me just read to you the Oregon okay. Constitution. Uh, specifically excludes the casinos in the state of Oregon <laughs> except for the, the native nations. Mm -hmm. The Oregon Lottery Commission was designed as a tax generating revenue by the state provided that the licensees don't generate more than 51 percent of their gross revenue from lottery machines. Mm -hmm. Now we encountered beginning in 2008, as you alluded to, the, the, the saturation of a small strip mall on Hayden Island that became, in effect, 
one big casino because at that time there were 14 licensed premises in this entire strip mall operating uh, lottery machines in there with the consequence that uh, crime went up, as we know, mm -hmm. traffic went up, mm -hmm. traffic accidents went up. And the, the, the original intent of the uh, Oregon Lottery Commission was, and I'll use their own language, which, you know, which I think you'll find very, very interesting, okay. because it says that under the Oregon rules, it said a fact is when they're considering to license a premise to, to have lottery outlets, a long-standing history as a neighborhood pub, hmm. as a factor that may demonstrate that the casino, that the establishment is not operating as a casino. And I, as a point of reference, get in your car, drive down Lombard, mm -hmm. take a look at the neighborhood saloons that are populated Lombard, and you'll see they've been there a long time, mm -hmm. and they all sell lottery. Whereas if you go to our experience, you go to uh, Hayden Island, the Hayden Island shops, their main purpose and their main generation of income is the lottery machines because I'm sure there's not too many people who want to drink and eat in there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you don't go to you don't go to a strip mall mm -hmm. where it's nothing but lottery machines to drink and eat. So casinos. Casinos. These yes. are casinos. These are casinos. Okay. You know, yeah. They're not legitimate businesses standing alone. Mm -hmm. There is a strip mall where uh, they divided it up into these small little bars, and they call them delis. Mm -hmm. So we have a row of delis, and eventually it be, just became a, uh, du they duplicated the Dottie's formula, where, you know, you get a, uh, what is it, 350 square feet, 400 square feet, whatever you need in order to get six lottery machines, mm -hmm. and that's their main source of revenue, but they don't declare that. There's a 49%, 51% rule, and you, as you'll learn through the show, mm -hmm. uh, that's what became we became aware of the discrepancy and in how it is reported. Okay, so, okay. So, you know, back to this T-shirt that's sitting here, yes. Lottery Row. Uh, we started as a neighborhood with real livability problems. Mm -hmm. And from that, we, you know, started investigating why 44% of all the crime on the island was in this small one strip mall. And uh, from there, we uh, uncovered all kinds of things. That, but we did get... Uh, a lot of neighborhood involvement uh, where people were, you know, obviously upset. Uh, they originally thought the Columbia River Crossings Bridge would wipe it all out mm -hmm. yes. because it was in the path of it. And now that the Columbia River Crossings Bridge is uh, apparently off the off track, uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, what are we going to do now? How do we mm -hmm. ever get this neighborhood strip uh, mall back to a real strip mall? Instead, we were stuck with this mini casino. What kind of crimes? Can you give us some samplings of uh, some of the things that were? There's a lot of drug dealing. There's uh, prostitution. Uh, you know, I met with uh, Commander Leloff of the North Precinct uh, when he was first uh, nominated in that position, and we met at the Red Lion. And he already, before he even stepped into that role, knew that most of the calls on the island were for those incidents. Mm -hmm. And it was happening right there in that concentrated area. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess we went on. You also made the point about why did we question the accuracy of the OLCC revenue reporting by the, the licensees? Want to follow up on that, please? Well, the, the accuracy was questioned because <clears throat> there was no uh, verified proof of the accuracy of the reports that the uh, establishments were giving to the Oregon State Lottery. Mm -hmm. So we got into it and we, start, we started looking at it and we asked the question of um, the former executive, now former executive director of the uh, lottery, Larry Nieswinder, if they were ever audited. And they said, no, they all self-report. But yet that self-reporting figure, the non-lottery gross sales, is an ingredient in the formula mm -hmm. that determines mm -hmm. whether they are a, lot, a casino or a non-casino but there's no certification. Now what happened is uh, we got into this issue of looking at, based on Larry's, uh, Mr. Nieswinder's uh, statement, looking at the financial report for the Oregon State Lottery. And they talk about being audited extensively, but they only talk about the extensive audits outside what the, the, they have the lottery money, how did they distribute it? That's, that's, that's audited, but not the non-lottery gross sales from the people that are supposed to be earning non-lottery income. And who's responsible for that signing off, if you will, of that? 
Uh, well, an authorized signature, they say. By whom? By is one the director? By, or by the applicant or, uh, let's say, the owner of the establishment or oh, anything like that. so you audit yourself. That's right. That's it. That's well, it. Then, I mean, how do you yeah. audit yourself, you know? Well, I'd love to be in that position. We were <laughs> given some samples through Tina Kotek's office of some of the reporting, and it was apparent to us, we didn't get a large sampling, but it mm -hmm. was apparent to us that these were numbers that fit the ratio without any backup information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what prompted you about, about doing that in terms of checking in this whole issue about the auditing? And well, it was, it was the response that we received at that meeting in uh, December of 2012, at a high noon uh, meeting, because Lottery Row is so prevalent in our, in our uh, community. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of attention and he came to talk and he said, when he was asked that question, he said, they self-report. And that's what, wait a second, come on, that doesn't sound right. And so we went from there. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started looking at it as a statewide issue. Yeah. Ah, okay. This is not a local issue anymore. This is a statewide issue. Yeah. It's the Oregon lottery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of why this resolution might be coming from Hayden Island, but it's basically addressing the entire state. We have this problem of licenses for lottery and liquor with no limits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's leading to things like Lottery Row. So I guess there was a lot of talk in the whole issue about the, the reporting process aspect of it. Did they, did they follow up from the standpoint of this is what we received? Did they give you samplings, if you will, of, of i.e. the Lottery Row there on, on Hayden Island in, in terms of uh, the numbers? Uh, did, they, did they give you anything to show you that in fact they had done this? No. Even though that the even though that the uh, the owners were basically doing their own insertions. No, well, one, Tina, of, the, one, one of, the, of the things that with Tina Kotek supplied us with that that uh, Representative Kotek supplied us with, she had her office she had her office do a spreadsheet of the at that time fourteen licensed premises in Hayden Island shops, showing us the ratio between the non lottery income and the lottery income. Mm -hmm. and you take one look at it and you start scratching your head. It just doesn't compute. Just well, how did she respond? Well, she wrote two measures and uh, you know presented them to uh, the legislator body uh, to get passed. But you know it be unfortunately was written uh, skewed more towards our neighborhood, even though it was a statewide issue, and so it really just didn't get tracked. But that's what we're asking for now and by having uh, Secretary or Secretary of State Kate Brown do an audit. That, that brings it to the state level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's given me uh, uh, momentum to continue on with this is uh, when you talk to other representative, representatives from other communities, mm -hmm. they are getting concerned about the, uh, seems to be just the irresponsible uh, uh, contracting with uh, establishments and it's creating a, in other neighborhoods, uh, I'll call it a lottery impact area or a alcoholic impact area, and it's becoming a public nuisance to them also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just us. It's, it's collateral damage. It's collateral damage from this aspect of it. Uh, Charlie, can you explain uh, why you feel the Constitution of the state is involved? Well, the Constitution is involved simply because, for whatever reason, that clause was put in, into the Constitution itself giving the exclusive right to have casinos to the native, the native tribes. Mm -hmm. What we found was that when the Lottery Commission began, they did exercise external controls. They did look into how the money was being reported, and in 1997, they determined that the licensees were not complying with the constitutional breakdown as to what the latter... You mean they knew then? Oh, yeah, in 97. They, they, uh, it was, in fact, the Dotties took it to court. And uh, the court held uh, at that time that the language of the, of the enabling statute that brought about this constitutional exception so that you could have a non-lottery business but sell lottery, et cetera, mm -hmm. was being violated. So it has been done. The only problem is it hasn't been done since 1997. And as we all know, uh, if you just look at the numbers, the licensing process has gone on really unabated. It's, it's, been, it's been 
saturating neighborhoods such as ours, there's no, there's no real consideration given to us of being given to a neighborhood pub, as the statute mm -hmm. says, or is it giving it to somebody that goes, spends 200 bucks, gets a corporation, and applies for a liquor license, and then gets a lottery mm -hmm. license? What we're asking, do your job. Mm -hmm. That's what the statute says. Do your job, make sure that you audit, and keep the integrity of the business where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Good governance. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. and transparency. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. That's well, not so much to ask. You mentioned that it, it went to court, right? It, yes. it went to court. And I take it that uh, Dottie then basically uh, shared, if you will, information, in fact, that they were doing and abiding, if you will, by the Constitution. Fair? Well, it was the business model. Their business model is not designed to run these operations like a neighborhood pub, right. as the language right. in the statute says. Right. It's designed to be just big enough, as Jeff alluded to, just big enough to get their six machines in there. Well, and, and, well during that particular court proceeding, did they were they granted the fact that they were neighborhood pubs at that point in time in no, 97? That was not brought up. That was not brought that up. That wasn't brought up no, in, the, in the hearings? The court determined okay. that the Oregon Lottery Commission had the authority to conduct this review, and they decided after the review that their income did not square up with the constitutional exception as to the percentages non-lottery money mm -hmm. and lottery money, well, and they were told, do it better. Do it, do do it, it, do it better, do it do over. Do it better, do it over. So then who, who, who followed up with another audit to show that, in fact, they so did So far did. as we can tell, there was never that procedure done again by any of the licensees, even though the licensees just proliferated all over the state. So give me an idea of the proliferation on St. John's neighborhood. Um, they're having trouble with convenience stores coming in because they just want to have the lottery there to sell. They have, what, a 7-Eleven store maybe one and a half blocks away from the other one because they can have lottery. So whether it's a pub uh, or you know, a bar or anything, a legitimate business that you know, qualify for lottery, you know, they're willing to give them the license. And so, you know, are they making, do they really need two 7-Elevens mm -hmm. or plaid pantries or whatever case is within blocks of each other? Hmm. Hmm. Just, so, just an example of. So, so again, we're, we're talking about many casinos uh, yes, in many we ways. Yes, that's we really, really are. That's really what we're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, that's a misnomer. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's, it's like it, it, it walks like a duck, quacks yeah, like yeah, a duck, yeah, and swims right. like a duck. Yeah. It's a duck. Yeah, call it a duck. My yeah. apologies to the Beaver fans. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> But, and you're from New York. <laughs> and I'm from New York. <laughs> so, so again, during that particular time, I guess the CEO was the governor. I mean, that's indirectly was the governor of the state of Oregon, right? At that time, I think it was Ted. I think Ted Kulingoski was the governor during that particular I, time. I don't know. I, I, I assume was. so. You, yeah, you yeah, Kulingoski was yeah, governor. Yeah, during, during that time when, when this issue, this major issue came up, if you will, right? Got me? And then they also appointed the director of the lottery. Yeah, right. well, it's all a political appointment. It's all political oh, yes, appointments, absolutely. that type of aspect absolutely. of it. Okay, so any response from the director of you? I, I'm sure that I'm, I'm trying to get into that kind of discussion in terms of who's responding to you all in regard to solving this problem. Then you got this letter now to the Secretary of State. Well, I'm sure you Tina exhausted Kotek, your response. Tina Kotek sent me an email, and her staff did, saying that she's applauding that and that she was going to make a. Uh, uh, have a meeting with State's uh, uh, Secretary of State Kate Brown and discuss this resolution to promote it. So we are getting backing that way. Do you realize what kind of legs that would have if Tina Kotek joined Representative? I mean, she's the Speaker of the House. Yes, if right. She, if she joined in our request to, to do an independent audit, what, what legs that would give the position we're taking, which we claim is obvious. Yeah. So it shouldn't have been an issue if Tina was taking the being that she's but the lead person. But I think you have to lead them. You have to. You, yeah. You, she needs input from the people she represents. This right. is input from people she represents. And I mean, she, like when she we, is our representative. Like right. When we she testified, is When we testified before the Oregon Lottery Commission, mm -hmm. we presented a petition of signed by over two thousand people supporting our position that something's got to be done. Well, you were. I mean, all due respect, uh, High Noon was making really an issue. I mean, you were marching and. You were demonstrating. I mean, I mean, you were really putting the issue out Initially, on the table. Initially, that was actually a small group of us, uh, Marty Slepikis, myself, and uh, Bill uh, Feldman, Feldman got together and uh, created this thing, Stop Lottery Row. Mm -hmm. And now High Noon has taken up that banner, and uh, you know we've come to this point where the Hayden Island Neighborhood Network, which is the Hayden Island Association for All the Neighbors, has passed this resolution unanimously. And on top of that, the North Portland Neighborhood Associations just uh, last week also passed uh, an approval 
for us to, to do this uh, resolution. And uh, now we're going after the entire uh, municipality of 95 neighborhoods to try to get their support. Mm -hmm. And then we'll end up as statewide. Mm -hmm. That's our goal. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's a statewide issue. It's not, it's not a Hayden Island issue anymore. Okay, good, good. Martin, let me bring you back in on this. What, what does your request for an audit have to do with transparency? Talk a little bit about that, look transparency. Well, it's interesting because <clears throat> you could say, what does a request have to do with non-transparency? Mm -hmm. There is yeah. no transparency in the internal operation of the Oregon State Lottery. And as a result, we're asking for some clarity as to how do they determine if an organization, an establishment, a video lottery retailer, mm -hmm. is or is not a casino. There's a lot of parameters that they use. They use square footage of a, they call it a viable business. Square footage of a, of the place, is it clean, is it neat, do they serve food, and other things. But one of the major things that's ignored is the financial aspect of the non-lottery gross sales. And that is an ingredient into a formula, which by the way, is an inaccurate formula in the regulation. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been going on for years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that it's a basically a lack of transparency. So reverse it, transparency is needed. Well, you know, when you're something at the formula, I looked at the formula myself, I was very, it seems to me it was a very simple looking formula. You know, you got, you got food and then you got income from the, from the lot of you. And you, you, you know, it should reflect IE 5149, right? It should. Right. So, I mean, that's a, that should be an easy sign off on the deal. And, and you can pretty well prove the food stuff because they got receipts, right? So if, if you was, audit the- If there was constant. Auditing. Constant auditing. Yeah. Or even a threat of an audit. Yeah. yeah. There, there isn't even that. None at all. None at all. Not that we know of. And, anyway. the, and the director of the uh, Oregon Lottery does have discretionary powers and has always had discretionary powers. And as far as we know, they are not exercised. So that, that issue came up when we were discussing Lottery Row. I'll go back to that uh, because of the concentration. Mm -hmm. And we, we said, well, we can't, why would you give so many licenses in one small area and not, no dry cleaners anymore, no beauty salon, no minute mark, nothing. You know, it's just all these little bars. You had the ability to say no mm -hmm. when they asked for the lottery license, but that never happened. <laughs> well, you know, it still is kind of confusing. Why is it that we can't, you know, wh why is this such a, a, an issue? Uh, when in essence, it's, it's all there on the table, if you will. I'm still trying to get to that. And who's responsible for signing off on this stuff? Well, the state is addicted to the money that comes in from lottery. It's pretty simple. So, so Judge, your, your point about the fact that uh, this sort of subsidizes a small little revenue, if you will, for the bars, if you will, the, the, the neighborhood bars, if you will, because a lot of times they've been there. They've been established there for years, if you will. Well, the average income, uh, we've been told, is 60,000 per year per machine. They get six machines. 60,000? 60, 60,000. That's the average. So the incentive to have lottery machines in your business is quite high. Mm -hmm. And so the, re the relationship between that 60,000 and now the, the neighborhood bar is not the neighborhood bar anymore. And well, it's, again, it's bringing in different well, kinds of be. folks. If, if it's a legitimate business, which right. just goes back to the very, the statute, about, yes. the very beginning. If you really want to get the, get the picture, you just have to go to the Hayden Island shops, the Hayden the Harbor shops, and look. And then just take a drive down Lombard, mm -hmm. starting at probably um, Interstate, and just head towards St. John's, and you'll see any number of neighborhood bars, pubs, neighborhood pubs that have been there. You can tell they've been there for years. They're equal. They're, they're spread out all over Lombard. Right. And the lottery in there is probably a good thing because what it does, it supplements the income mm -hmm. of a neighborhood establishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The converse is happening, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The opposite effect is happening because the business model that's being used doesn't support the idea of a neighborhood pub. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other thing, you ask about you know, integrity control, you take Nevada. We know for sure because we asked the Nevada Gambling Commission, do you regularly audit your licensees? And they said, absolutely. Again, it becomes so obvious that the commission is not doing its job. And we, all we're asking is that they do their job. We don't want to, there's no way in the world you're going to stop gambling, and that's never our goal. But if they're going to 
do that model, make the people who get the license comply with the law. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. Or change the model. Or change mm -hmm. the model. And mm -hmm. be transparent and open about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If this now, isn't working. It's not rocket science. If this is not legal. Yeah, right, right. Then, you know, you, may, you have to make some adjustments. Now, you talked a little bit, you alluded to the, the commission. Now, now what's the makeup of the commission? Are these political appointments? Are they elected appointees? No, or what? they're not what's elected appointees. They're not elected appointees? They're all appointed, at the, they're all appointed with the advice and consent. It's appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of, this, of the legislature. Mm -hmm. But it's all, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, a gov it's a governor appointment, mm -hmm. gubernatorial appointment. Mm -hmm. Well, look, let's go back a minute in regards to um, the issues when, when the Jeff was bringing up about uh, what, what, were, what the, as a result of this, there's these many casinos that you're on Hayden Island, it was, it was bringing up the issue of crime and all of the major crime aspect. Of, now police is involved in this process. Now, now when you can audit them because they've got it, they write reports all the time. What, 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 how, would, how did they get involved? Did they, i.e., uh, endorse? Well, like or? I said, Commander Levoff met me at the uh, Red Lion uh, before he even became commander of the North Precinct, and he said, we, we got a problem here. We need to fix this. So we got a lot of uh, you know, help from the local police, and they even did a sting. Uh, we got one conviction or two convictions. Two convictions. But we had 26, I think, arrests, but they had complications with... Uh, the informant that they used, who we don't know what happened to him, but all of those cases got thrown out. But uh, the point is, is that, uh, yes, at the expense of the public who pays for policing, right. uh, you know, this, uh, this type of phenomena causes a lot of money to be spent uh, that maybe was unnecessary if the application uh, of licenses was more controlled. Mm -hmm. Well, how did the mayor? Do it? How, how did the mayor at that point in time? I think it was Sam Adams at that point in time. How did he react, if you will, to this current? Did you all bring your issues up with him? You know, I didn't. Uh, but I also thought it was kind of strange that uh, if livability is an issue in the whole city of Portland, mm -hmm. that uh, the livability issue on Hayden Island, is what started uh, this whole thing, was clearly deteriorating. You would think that it would come to the attention of the city administration. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we, we my, I personally uh, didn't get no reach out to anybody there because I really never even knew that there was anybody there. We, we learned later on that there is somebody appointed with the uh, city of, New, of Portland that uh, to, coordinates with all of to, that. To address that exact question, Mayor Hales, I think just uh, Thursday of this week with, uh, I forget what the name of the organization was, that he was uh, addressing young uh, people in politics, but uh, he did bring up the old town and uh, the fact that in order to change the economic balance and the livability of a neighborhood, you can't just have restaurants and bars, you have to have other businesses. Yeah. And I thought that was, uh, you know, commendable on Mayor Hale's part to realize, you know, uh, not how much government plays really in creating businesses is always a interesting, you know, discussion in itself, but he's correct in that, uh, that statement. I think, I think uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, the increase in the, uh, in the lottery retailers there because everybody thought that Columbia River Crossing was going to go in and eliminate that whole area and they were going to get uh, some kind of stipend, uh, eminent domain out of business. But the issue is still, as Jeff keeps bringing up, is turning out to be statewide. At least it's we can say it's expanding outside the vicinity of Portland. Other neighborhoods in the city of Portland and as far down as Westland are beginning to complain about the proliferation of, of uh, the combination of lottery, video lottery, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So the two of them are intertwined. And there really is a very limited amount of enforcement of uh, capability from the commissions or from the uh, from the actual agencies involved so they have to rely on local law enforcement which drains that th those functions uh, the, the the budget for those law the local law enforcement uh, I, I asked unofficially what commander Lilov thought it would uh, the indictment and the sting operation costs and he said hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. No, so no. And, that's, and I don't think that's fair, frankly. No, no, no. no. I really don't. Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break and come back to the many casino problems <laughs> that we have here in the state of Oregon. We'll be right back. Is this a commercial? You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. 
This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back again to the Working Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I'm, I'm visiting with a group of folks from High Noon and Hayden Island. Or most of you might uh, familiar with Jansen Beach, where you normally go and whatever. And uh, you might have noticed uh, maybe some of the traffic issues and whatever in this, in this little small area. I mean, what, some 14, 14, 14 mini casinos, if you will, in that area. And, uh, and all kinds of issues. As far as I, I live on the island myself, and and I'm very familiar with the crime rate, if you will, breaking and entering cars. I, uh, my wife, she owns a small business there, and, and we we don't have any any machines, if you will. But but again, it does bring bring in all sorts of issues with transits and things of that nature and the like. And it's a nuisance, and uh, people would be surprised as far as the livability. There's a there's a quite a community there, of seniors and and families, if you will, on the island. A lot of folks don't know. You just think maybe it's just Jansen Beach. You just go in and you shop and you leave. Well, a lot of people but, don't know it's an island. That's right. That's, that's right. That's, that's another major major just point. Just exit to that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so so anyway, it's an issue. And uh, but as a result of the the concern of this community who reacted, if you will. Uh, this issue not, doesn't, doesn't just relate to Hayden Island or Jansen Beach. It's all over the state. I mean, what is, the, what, what is happening, if you will, uh, the impact of crime here within the state of Oregon as a result of these so-called mini casinos? And it draws all kinds of people, from, even from outside. It's almost like a 24-7 operation also, too. And, um, and that wasn't what it was meant to be. I mean, I think the Native Americans, I mean, we pretty well, we, we had, what, two, three major casinos in the state. And people well, less than 25, that's yeah, for sure. About less than 25 or so, okay. And people just frequent those. I, I, I know a lot of the seniors would go because they had nothing, many didn't have anything to do, if you will. But the fact of the matter is uh, they were well-maintained, uh, they, were, they were supervised, this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden someone introduced this idea uh, why don't we put these uh, these machines in the, in these in the bars, if you will, in the, in the local pubs and whatever? And in fact, what I'd like to do now is, is uh, my guests here from High Noon, and uh, again, we're talking about Marty and Charlie and, and Jeff. They're all High Noon uh, folks, and they've they've gotten involved in this piece. Uh, let's, let's spend a little bit more time now on the history in terms of if, if anybody's got that that background. If, uh, how did this all begin, if you will? I realize we had the commission, right? The governor pretty well. Did we vote? Did we vote it for this this whole issue of of, of uh, providing the this kind of uh, entertainment to, to the community? Yeah. So far as we can tell, I mean, let me just give you a little segue here. We were blessed over the summer to have three law students on a pro bono program working with us. When we would bounce ideas off them, and they would do research. They were the ones that found this 1997 case. And yes, when you read the history of the 1997 case, there was a time where a ballot initiative went on. Okay. And the ballot initiative was passed, it was challenged, and it was found to be constitutional. And that probably, I don't know exactly, but that probably gave birth to uh, the Oregon Lottery Commission in its infancy. And that's what gave birth to them in 1997, truly managing how the licensees were generating their income, and that's when they found out that when they did their review, that the income on the land lottery side and the income on the lottery side was out of proportion, and they were told, you have to change the way you do business in order to stay in compliance with the formula. And at that time, the formula was, I believe, 
one third, two thirds. Yeah. Now it's forty nine fifty one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was started as a ballot initiative. Ballot it was initiative. challenged constitutionally, and the Supreme Court of Oregon held that it was a constitutional right to do that, uh, and it didn't violate the mm -hmm. constitutional uh, pro prohibition against only the Native Americans having casinos because they weren't casinos. Mm -hmm. One third, two thirds. Explain that. Well, it was one one third uh, lottery revenue and two thirds non lottery revenue. Right? Ah, okay. Who initiated that? Was there was there a, by a group of legislators, or was there one legislator, no, no, or was it the was, governor, or was it? No, it was the Oregon Lottery Commission that uh, that sent a letter to uh, at that time was Dottie's number one, saying you're out of, you're out of compliance. You have to comply, and if you don't comply, we will terminate your license. And then. Dotties challenged them from doing that, and the courts said, no, they were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. And they went to the courts? Oh, yes. Which court? Supreme Court? Oh. I don't know that it went to the Supreme Court. I was trying to find a copy of the decision. I know yeah, it. I haven't, mean, I haven't yeah. been able to now the politics come in. But now. it was a published decision, and that's what, the, that's what our interns found for us, and I thought it was a, you know, it was a, a marvelously enlightening decision. Yeah, yeah. Because it shows what the commission can do when it wants to. You know, I don't want to hog the time, but just as yeah, yeah, Marty sure, and yeah. I always talked about the issue here was the difference between the Oregon Lottery Commission selectively or non-selectively yeah. mm -hmm. enforcing the regulations. To us, since not doing anything with returns to reviewing the non-lottery income reporting from 1997 to 2014, that's non-selective enforcement of their rules. They're ignoring the rules. Marty? Marty? Well, I, I wanted to go back a moment. I thought your question was, how, how did we get to this particular point in relationship to video lottery machines and bars and things like that? <laughs> and I go back to the mission of the lottery is to, is to develop gaming uh, that will provide income to the state of Oregon. And they they go nationwide and determine if this machine is going to do well for for the state or not or how however it is and they're constantly trying to get more uh, uh, how would you say uh, enjoyment of uh, entertainment better value. entertainment machines entertaining machines that will draw in customers and so they get into video lottery now what's interesting uh, I just read an article in the Oregonian, I think it's Saturday, where they say the video lottery retailing uh, income is down. It's down. It's down. And what's okay. interesting is what I'm, what I'm predicting is if they're going to, if that is true, then I suspect that it's going to be an effort to increase the number of video retailing outlets throughout the state to increase that income to broaden the to broaden the number of video retailers rather than rather than uh, increase new machines and stuff hmm. so anyway it's just going to be it's it's going to they're going to be more licenses there're going to be more more shops more video retailers in a particular neighborhood but i thought that's where we were for over proliferation isn't that where well, we are to a certain degree but the but that was that uh, yeah we are right now yeah right now yeah. so they're going to increease that i mean do you have every corner or something like Starbucks. It's not inconceivable because there is no saturation or concentration standard in the licensing That's right. process. There are no limits. All you have to be it, no all, limits. Yeah, all you have to do is go through a background check and if right. you, if you come out with no criminal history or nothing you got derogatory, me. you qualify for a license. They're in the pub. Marty has maintained and he should discuss it with you. Marty has maintained all along that this licensing should be done to businesses that can show you yeah. that they're viable, viable. Yeah. first. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, yeah, would, my, atti would. my attitude is, is for 90 days, theoretically, any one of us can go in there. Well, you're already in business, but I could go in and establish something for 90 days and then say, okay, I'm a viable business. I have no income. I have no, no resources other than I have a, a shell of a building, the square footage, and I can hang a sign out says I'm a neighborhood pub, and maybe I could get a plot for a license to the lottery. The question is, how, where's the financial aspect of that? Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, my contention is we should look at the at least one ye, one reporting tax year and say what was your income? Are mm -hmm. you a viable business there? Mm -hmm. And that would be the basis for the non-lottery 
revenue. That would be the base. In that case, it would be probably, well, it could be either gross or net, depending mm -hmm. upon which way you wanted to be. But the point is, use something that is can be substantiated. Right now, it's me reporting to them saying, hey, I, uh, I've got X amount of revenue for non-lottery sales. Mm -hmm. it, it brings up the old saying, follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you track yeah. that, and you, yeah. you've got your answers. But you can't, without an audit, you can't follow the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when, when Charlie was making the point about um, about the local pubs and things of that nature, that was that was pretty well a standard, if you will, in most communities. And normally, an established pub was it had to have been there at least five years plus. Mm -hmm. That would have been a good standard to use it. You know, five years plus. So if you weren't in business five years. You should not have been allowed to, to have gotten those machines, if you will, so to speak, because you know that's their main staple, and people are there frequently eating there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it wouldn't be just kind of a situation where they're all of a sudden they're just going to switch and just start playing the pub, because the idea is to get folks in the community out of their homes, you know, seniors wherever, just sit down away from the home and just relax and meet other folks and be a good neighbor. But like you made it, the point you made, Martin, 90 days? I mean, how does that constitute, if you will, a business? It doesn't. So someone should have been able to bring that issue to the table. Now I'm asking the question that what is the makeup, if you will? Can you give me a little makeup of the commission? What is the makeup of the commission? I know there are political appointments. Are there, are there folks with, there with restaurant background and businesses background and uh, community organizations background? And Well, I know one of them has to be a CPA, and I believe one has to be an attorney. I, the others, I think, can be just a mixed bag of businesses that are people that are interested or look like they might be able to. But uh, who are these somebody. people? I know some of them were ex-legislators. I remember there was one situation where the, some guy was doing something wrong or something. There was a write-up way back when. Who was that? You know that guy? Um... I'm sorry. But you don't talk about it, but, but it's the, kind of What's interesting, I, I, you're saying, what's, what's the background? Well, there's an issue now with uh, conflict of interest with uh, uh, the current chair, Eliza DeZono. She is a partner in the Miller Nash Law Firm who represents Dotties in liquor license, in the liquor business. And she's the chair of the Oregon State Lottery. Commission. That issue was brought up in the Oregonian. Yeah, they said it was, uh, they said, they said, what they, happened? The yeah. ethics committee ruled that it was uh, um, not a uh, violation of the ethics law because she was uh, determined to be by just one, either her own self description or uh, the personal assessment of the executive director of the ethics commission to be a non equity partner and had no. Um, uh, no ties to the relationship of money going into Miller Nash. But the governor described her as a partner, Governor Kitzhaber described her as a partner when he nominated her, and after she was nominated, Miller Nash describes her as a partner in, on their press releases. So, And they represent Dottie's that's got 40 licenses yeah. in the state. Let me give you an example. Jeff, Forty licenses. Yeah. yeah. Jeff hit the nail on the hat, hit the nail on the head. You're a small businessman on Hayden Island, yeah. and your main product is food. Yes. Okay. Good to it, by the way. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I love you. Pull <laughs> food. 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 terrific. Food. 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 For the Not period, I just for do the as period I'm told. May then May 2009 to April 2010, one Dottie's establishment, nay. Harbor Shops on Hayden Island, Dottie's Upper 24, reported that they had, get this now, $3,571,000 in non-lottery sales. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we, we go a little slow when you put that. I the, will. Say it one more time. One, <laughs> now, what, the, what's the deal the, now? For the period May 2009. May 2009. To April 2010. Okay. Dottie's number 24, which is located amongst all of the other shops. That's just one of them. Just one of them. And they had, I think they had at that time, one, two, three, four, five, at least five, plus two leases. They're, they're not all named Dotties. No, they're, they're not all named. But okay. this, this, Oregon Restaurant This services. is called, this is, yeah, Oregon Rush, but Dottie's number 24, which is located in the harbor shops where we had the increase in crime. And you know the size of your restaurant. Yes. And you know, 
And we you only need 360 square feet for the... Don't quote me on that. Well, whatever. <laughs> the limited. They reported non-lottery sales for that one-year period, May 2009 to April 2010, Three million five hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars. That's ridiculous. Uh, well, and that's not. When I saw that number, I, I just did a little research, and I was telling Marty and Jeff about. It. Did a little research. The average McDonald's that's right. in the United States of America averages somewhere around two plus five million a year, and they only sell hamburgers right. and chicken. Yes. Yes. Wow. Now. I'm not a man of numbers. <laughs> Marty, is, Marty understands this a lot better than I do. But I, as a citizen, as a citizen, when I saw those numbers, I'm saying to myself, what's the Lottery Commission doing? I mean, that just jumps out like a red herring like you've ever, never seen before. If you take the six machines at 60,000 a year, that's 360,000. It doesn't fit the ratio. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Wow. Now, in this case, it's to their favor, but the number is astronomical. It is. Astronomical. That's why I'm saying, if you reported a constant stream at enormous losses, losses, losses yeah. due to increase yeah, yeah, in yeah, cost yeah. of goods sold, mm -hmm. what's the first thing that the either the Oregon Department of Treasury oh, or the IRS there. is going oh, to do? Oh, yeah. oh. And what are they going to do for you? Yeah. They're going to yeah. do an audit. Oh, yeah, big time. All right? Yes. That's all we're asking. Yeah, big about. time. So... I'm saying if there's a CPA on the board, if there's a lawyer assigned from the Department of Justice to the Oregon Lottery Commission and there's a lawyer on the board and Denozo's a lawyer, doesn't $3,500,000, $571,000 scream at you? And then you go up there and you look at the number in the same year for Bradley's, uh, it's $299,483. Probably a much more realistic number. That's not a hot dog, so. No. <laughs> that's a lot. Well, that's that's not, even that I mean, is not a hot dog. Let me tell you. I don't that. like to go back to the, you know, the problem at Hayden Island because it's a, it's a state level. But, uh, you know, these these establishments, uh, most of them don't have a kitchen. And you you can go in there and ask for food, and they'll kind of laugh at you like, well, we don't really serve any food here. We've got liquor, we got cigarettes, you know, we have things like that. But we've got nice machines over there, which people kind of put their name on. You know, they actually get very possessive about Well, that's why I was I go back to the first point in terms of who, si who signed off, if you will, on this, this new mini casinos. If, in fact, that's what they were going to be, they should have said that. That's what we're going to do. We're going to establish mini casinos <laughs> all over the state. And then all of a sudden, now you know exactly what it is. Now I'm saying, we can start talking about well, how much revenue uh, will the people get as a result of that. First, that would have been unconstitutional. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, use the word. I don't think anybody had to sign off on it. It was just an institutional uh, development where they, they started out with thinking that, hey, let's put some, uh, we got somebody that owns this property over here, he likes to get some income, so let's they got uh, bars over there. Let's put the allow if they apply for a license, we give them a license, a contract with them, to put the video lottery machines in there, and they just little by little just got into an area like the mm -hmm. harbor shops. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we would not have this. We wouldn't be here talking about mm -hmm. this had the Oregon Lottery abided by their own rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. That's all they had to do, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Money. Well, money, and that could be the, the landlord, money. that could be the owner of diamonds, yeah. that could yeah. be anybody. But the point yeah. is, it is, a, it is, I'm getting more and more uh, information that it is becoming an issue with other, other communities. And maybe not necessarily way out in the, on the east, uh, eastern part of Oregon, where they do have a neighborhood pub, sure. and they do have a lottery and a, and a, a serving liquor. And that's not a problem. The community likes it. The problem is when it becomes a public safety issue and a livability mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. and you know it when you've got when you've got derelicts hanging out on your doorstep oh, in the neighborhood. So. Yeah, very much so. I mean, businesses downtown have got that problem. Yeah. Well, Portland seems to like it downtown mm -hmm. for some reason. I don't understand why, but the, normally, residential communities don't care for that, mm -hmm. and we we'd rather we don't mind them coming in and having a bar and a, and a lottery, but unfortunately, don't. If you're going to, if you can, my attitude is cynically, mm -hmm. if you're going to destroy a neighborhood, do it according to the regs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you bring up a good point about uh, that revenue piece because 
I um, I was looking at um, there was there were several of them that they were closed and, 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 I, and we so I looked into um, what it would cost to to lease a place like that and they were making the point for 300 square feet or so four thousand dollars a month. Bruce, it's higher. The though. casinos are paying eight thousand dollars a month. Eight. Thousand dollars a month for three hundred square feet, and that's the bottom number because, like, you go to a commercial lease, there's always that additional rent clause in there right, that right. says your eight thousand dollars is your base number because we're gonna we're entitled to a percentage of the proceeds, and you get a dis and you and and that's what determines your rent, and mm -hmm. you can you can gladly deduct right, the eight thousand right, right, dollars, right, right. but it may cost you nine thousand dollars a year, right, right, right. eight thousand dollars a year, eight times. Dollars. The number of units over there. Which was Figure it out. The, uh, the 300 some square feet or 400, whatever it is, that's, yeah. that is what has to be available for the to, to get the yeah, machines. Right, to get machines. You have to have more space. But you have to have the restaurant part in there. Exactly. That other four, that, that other. Just so that people understand. Yes, right, right. You have to have that restaurant part. I mean, that's supposed to be the, the mainstay, right. the mainstay, if you will. But you're not selling that kind of, you know, I mean, you, there's nowhere in the world. I mean, $8,000 to rent that spot? Well, common sense. And that's on record. We got a cut again. The representative Kotex office was terrific, and they supplied us with a copy of their lease. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, and yeah. when we had the hearing, what, the other people were complaining about the fact that it was close. The other licensees were complaining about the fact it's costing them eight thousand dollars a month. Yeah. That's well, a ton of money. That's that's the other time. bottom line that came out of this, uh, Marty. Uh, what was it that uh, uh, Dottie said? in lieu of the bills that uh, Tina had written, that if uh, we made it so that these this ratio they got audited, that they actually wouldn't be able to stay in business. Yeah, yeah that was a letter that uh, uh, Mr. Fisher sent to Representative Kotek, and it was reported in the Oregonian. Dan, Dan Fisher owns Dottie's. Don okay. Fisher, yeah. And uh, he, he was extolling the virtues of his business model and saying, if you eliminate or you impose this uh, House Bill 2007 on us, or 2006, uh, we, we will not be able to function. Hmm. Well, I, and, yeah, obviously. Well, it's, it, <laughs> that's uh, what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's I mean, nice of him to tell us that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, all in the, it's all in the audit. It's going to be interesting to see what the Secre Secretary of State does. And uh, I hope she she takes it very serious because we're pretty serious. Well, you know, in all due respect, um, that's why we're, you know, that's why many citizens are having concern about our elected leadership within our midst. Who's going to be able to take this ball and, and, and resolve the problem that you are, we're having here in Hayden Island? And in all due respect, from what we've gathered, what I've gathered here today, you got all the facts, you've gone to all of these various folks, people who are in the leadership roles, people who've created these issues and whatever, and they're not responding because the bottom line, the money is basically putting them in office to make decisions, guess for whom? Not the people. <laughs> it's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and that's why we're having this election. That's why it's so important that you, <laughs> that you, that you really pick up on this this manual here, and really look at the folks that, that are that are running for office. We've got we've got the governorship race, if you will. And it'd be interesting to see just how would they respond if you if media would brought would have brought this issue. That's what we're doing right here today, yeah. and we're going to hopefully email this particular show to to both uh, gubernatorial candidates and even the congressional candidates. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we're having problems with reference to leadership. Hmm. Well, Any response? Well, uh, how do we do? Well, I think from the top down, you're right. Uh, and that's where you have to start looking. Uh, but then as you get into the, uh, the weeds of everything, uh, you realize that our uh, state and our communities uh, are also strongly affected by committees and commissions. And then when you find out that the, commission, the commissioner is appointed by a governor, or you know, in, this, in this particular case, you start realizing that there's not a simple answer yeah. to our problems. And the fact that we have uh, loss of revenue, if this is correct, on the uh, lottery side, we also know that there's a loss of revenue on the transportation side because cars are more efficient, etc. So, you know, you have a government that is trying to uh, continue to operate and offer benefits to schools and everything, and yet we have dwindling funds. So this, we know we're not going to, and we're not trying to eliminate the lottery, 
but you know, if we can aud get an audit done on this, then maybe we can get audits done on other parts of our government, mm -hmm. so we can find out what the real picture is. Mm -hmm. And then when you vote, you have it, you know what you're voting on. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's so many things that people don't know that it's. It, I think it causes skepticism. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. at every level, which is yeah. sad. And by the way, this is not anti-business we're talking about. No, 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 this no, is not no, anti-business. No, no. You know, I mean, a businessman is a business. If you invest your money in something, you're looking for a return. It's the it's the other it's the people who are signing off in terms of how much of a return, and what what's the purpose in in, in terms of what the you're trying to do. Of yes, we yes, need more yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And even the individuals are here, but but my point is that they're not going to make the decision say to to cut their bottom line. It's the well, people who have signed off. That's the ones. We're just asking for transparency. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any lasting points? We got about another minute. Or I so. want them to abide by the, the, their own regulations. The the Oregon State Lottery Commission can write their own laws, mm -hmm. and they did with the, the laws that they're operating under right now. But they're not abiding by the ones they wrote. Mm -hmm. And so, come on, folks. Charlie? The Oregon Lottery Commission really doesn't have a police force like the OLCC yeah. supposedly does, but Good they point. have the hammer. They really have the hammer because if they do the audit and they find that you're out of compliance, they can say to you, square it away or you lose your license. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the biggest hammer in the whole world. Please, take it out of the toolbox. Good. Jeff, what do you say to the governors, the people who are running for governor right now? you got two individuals running for governor. One is, well, what I, what I want to get to the point is I, I like to, I think we have uh, a lot of good things. Livability in this city is, is wonderful. We have problems. Uh, but this type of a problem puts another burden on our police force. And they are underfunded. And we have, you know, a real problem there. But they're the ones that took burden on to try to help us. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, they... Uh, the way of officiating this should not have been at that level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been great. And then to the viewing audience out here, many casinos, is, do we want them here? Do we don't want, or don't we? The fact of the matter is we're right into the election year aspect of it. These people are asking for your vote. Well, bring this issue up and ask them what's their position on this issue. Because in all due respect, they will be appointing these folks and they'll be making the decisions in terms of some of the concerns that we're having. High crime, this, that, and the other. So we've got some real serious problems right here. So, again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. And, uh, and by the way, please get out and vote. Don't, uh, don't, don't say anything after it's, after it's over with. Thank you. Get out and vote. Don't want to hear that. Okay? Have a good one. Take care. See you next time around. Have a good one.